Seems like you're living the American dream, actually. Most people can't take it, they freak out, you know? I think you're actually probably one of the best players these days. Over the past few years, I've really come into my stride as a person. I call him the coonster. And I'll get over things that I screwed up because I'm human. Focusing on family makes a lot of sense. It's as real as anything else. For that one, it helps to have some mindset shifts. If you said something like that in the real world, people's heads would explode. What's up, guys? Today, we've got a very special guest. He's, uh, I call him the Coonster. He's, uh, he's a bit of a crusher in all scenes, as far as I'm aware. He's winning over $38 million in tournaments, and who knows what he's winning in cash games, but I've seen him around in some of the biggest cash games. So who knows, who knows how many millions this guy has won? He's a Triton ambassador, and... Um, is on the board for GG Network as well. Uh, got a bit of a name and a bit of a, a scene. He's also got the figure to match. Mr. Coon, Jason Coon, what's up? What's up, Jungle? Not much. Uh, yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit how uh, you got into poker? It seemed like, from my understanding, you got into it just, uh, you just like kind of stumbled on the opportunity and saw like it was a bit of a, you know, it, it was a great opportunity to make money. Yeah, so rather than like tell my story because it's kind of a default one, I'll I'll tell some things that are different about my story. Okay. Um, Great. One time I was in I was in college, like right when the stuff was popping off, and I was walking through a bookstore and I saw the Dang Brothers on a cover of a magazine. It was like a poker magazine, and they looked so cool, and I was like, "Damn, who are these dudes?" So I downloaded Full Tilt, and I was watching these guys play these giant stakes and. As I came up, you know, the ranks and the small stakes, I still, I always felt like I just missed the boat because I was getting to the level where I could play in the games with those guys that originally inspired me. Um, and then, you know, I saw you smashing everybody heads up right around the time right before Black Friday. And I was just below getting to play those games. And um, I definitely didn't belong in them at the time. But the the revolutionary moment for me was after Black Friday, whenever I thought, you know, we all got screwed and we did, but I thought it was a horrible time for all of this and ended up being like the biggest, the biggest change for me in a positive way was I became roommates with Ben Tolerine, um, also known as Ben 86. And I saw an elite poker player and it was like this, this moment of realizing how ignorant I was to thinking that I was a really good poker player when I just wasn't. And I saw what it took to be a good poker player and what a good poker player actually looked like. And that was kind of like me being reborn as a poker player and me being re-inspired uh, in 2012, 2013. You had your poker, uh, what was it called? Uh, awakening. That's right. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And I think about, you know, how confident we can all be as poker players in spots that we really shouldn't be confident. And to me, it was like, oh, my God, like I thought I was good at poker and I'm terrible, and I'm clueless, and this guy is so good, and like, it messed with my confidence for, for quite a while, but it, it, it really should have, you know, it was, it was dumb confidence, it, it was un, unearned confidence, ignorant. Oh, well, that's like the mistake that people make, is they're always confident when they shouldn't be, that's like the, yeah. the thing about poker, is, is, is like the, the mistake you always find yourself making. Can you talk a little bit about what it was about him that opened up your eyes? Yeah, yeah, especially about, like, if you could give some examples of some situations. Absolutely. So, like, my thought process was just kind of pseudoscience. Like, a lot of stuff that I thought was really important to the way that I played a hand, he would just be like, that's nonsense, man. Like, everything that you're saying is just, like, you're just making up on a whim. You know, I would, I would pretend to have almost, like, mystical abilities of, like, understanding the way that a person was going to respond to this little move that I made or, or I would not give any credence whatsoever to my holding. And I would just decide like this person's bluffing. And like, you can say, Oh, that's like the artistic fun part of poker is just to kind of play streets poker. But I had absolutely no fundamentals. I was just raw aggression and just <laughs> kind of smart at, at like picking up on patterns, but most of it was just nonsense. And, um, you know, I just wasn't very good. So for him to see, I saw a guy that was very scientific in his thinking, and it wasn't like he would stick to the script. He was very exploitative, but his just his 
roots and his foundation were all based off of things that actually made sense. They all added up and um, his strategies were so much more sound than mine. Okay. I, um, I know a little bit about your games, or at least I think now I do think of you as more of a methodical player uh, in the sense of, I mean, I've had a couple conversations with you. Maybe there's some street stuff still going on. It's hard to imagine, uh, you know, once a street player is, is there always still a little street in there? Now you're all uh, like professional and uh, oh, no, man. streamlined. I I obviously like the first X amount of millions of hands that I played like that have, have benefited me, if anything, from like a metagame standpoint, because you can see other professionals that are younger or in early iterations of their poker career, and you can kind of make assumptions that they're somewhere close to where you were. So I can put myself oftentimes in, at least make a better guess at the way that I think other people are thinking about the game if I'm playing like a main event or a small side event or something. Um, and you, you do develop feel, you know, being in the streets and just playing every hand completely recklessly and just, just making uh, huge deviations left and right. You do develop kind of a feel for the limits that you can take it to. And, and so for, for exploitative reasons, definitely made me a much, much better poker player, of course. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, it is helpful to, it can be helpful to have a style or like a, view of things that is suboptimal uh in the long run as weird as that is in that it gives you like a unique perspective that's that sounds like what you're saying exactly yeah or just like sometimes you know you 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 get a very quick sense of how a person plays like that's kind of the beauty of live poker just you can make you know their stereotypes but you can play 20 or 30 hands and you're like oh i know roughly how this guy's thinking about poker and how he's playing. And then you can reference back to the way that you played when you were thinking that way. And the next thing you know, you can make like a pretty accurate guess a lot of the time based off of the mistakes that you used to make or the deviations that you used to make. All right. So it sounds like you were uh, out on the streets causing crime and then <laughs> you became like the, the officer of the streets and now you're pulling uh criminals in left and right basically yeah man i really didn't think i could do it either um it was one of the things that uh i stopped playing live poker for a while and i just locked myself up i was in whistler uh british columbia and i locked myself up and in, in my friend's cabin and i just played zoom no limit for you know tens of thousands of hands and i wasn't very good but i started to build fundamentals and um, I had a lot of talks uh, back and forth with a few of my close friends, uh, been included, and I just started building that way. And then once, you know, tools got better to study with, well, that was kind of my wheelhouse. I knew how to study efficiently and I knew like, okay, I can organize my day in a way where if I approach using tools this way, I can get a lot better. And, and I think that that's where I made my big leap. Okay, I do understand you worked quite hard uh, to become better. It wasn't like something that just naturally fell in your lap and you, uh, no. I don't know the full story, but it, it seemed like you like properly grinded and weren't really, you weren't killing it, but you were like. Absolutely not. No, I mean, I played, you know, I, I had some really big scores uh, early on in my career, but I just was an idiot and blew through money and gave it away and did, you know, the typical stuff that a, a, a kid that had no money that came into money would do. Um, but once I made those mistakes over and over again, luckily I was, for lack of a better term, resilient enough to just keep coming back and trying to learn. And, and I did have, you know, a pretty mediocre go of it for several years, but I was working and, and then there was a, a stage where I was getting rapidly better, but there's, there's almost a sort of a, you have to get worse before you get better in poker. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes sense with a lot of things. You have to deconstruct some bad habits yeah, or some habits that are kind of working. Along the way, you know, you lose your confidence and you're deconstructing bad habits. So like, even though I was, my poker aptitude was higher, I was actually playing worse than I was before because I just didn't have the confidence to know when to kind of go off script or trust my gut or, or do the things because you, you know, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm out here in, in fake land playing all these wild hands. I need mm -hmm. to be, I need to be more focused, more concrete, more fundamental. But what ended up happening was I shifted all the way over here to kind of 
trying to stick by the book and not exploit the way that I should have. And, and I got myself smashed for, you know, a couple of years and just actually ended up being quite exploitable in a lot of ways. Um, be, yeah, I, I was exploitable in a lot of ways, even because I was trying to play more fundamental. And I'm sure other people that have made this attempt uh, understand what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I myself had periods like that where I like shifted my strategy and still got messed up in all sorts of ways. And I, I can imagine that it, it would be relatable for a lot of poker players who are trying to improve and come up in the ranks and that kind of thing, just because a lot of them probably, it just seems like there will have to be some periods of uh, uncertainty or bad results on the way towards very good results is my guess. Yes. Yeah, it's hard to, these kinds of things are not linear. Um, it also goes through a lot of emotional things, or it reminds me of a lot of emotional progresses in certain ways and dealing with a lot of things. I mean, poker is good in the sense of like, a lot of other things in life work that way. Actually, you know what um, this reminds me of is in fact, uh, at least for me, I uh, uh, one way that I admire you is you're one of the poker players that's actually in good shape and you're really good at... Uh, you know, being disciplined about it and you have a really good diet and all these fitness things seem like cake to you. I, yeah. on my journey towards having a better, um, improving my health and fitness and all that, like it was a bit of a, um, it was a bit of a learning curve and it wasn't just as uh, straightforward as I thought it was. It's actually quite a lot of it tougher than I imagined it to be. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, man. It, the thing for me, though, is that was my safe space ever since I was a little kid. You know, I people um, all the compliments that I got at a kid as a kid were related to my athletic stature, you know. So, oh, okay. yeah, so I just I'm kind of a natural at it. But it um, it has been really fun over the years to um, chisel down and be more efficient with my time and focus on the things that actually give me value, like. I used to just lift really heavy weights and it wasn't very functional. And now, you know, I'm, I'm 10 pounds lighter than, than I was for the last, I don't know, I'd say for the last three or four years, I've been about a, a little under 180 pounds. And through all my twenties, I was like 185, 190, even close to 200 sometimes. And, and just kind of a meathead, you know, but now it's like, I, I'm focusing on focus and longevity and, and oh, okay. just getting the most out of my body. And um, so yeah, it's something I was naturally gifted at and I always had a sense of pride. And so I understand people, you know, I see a lot of my poker friends that come from academia and they have so much confidence in their, in their intellect and their ability to make good decisions, but they have no confidence whatsoever whenever it comes to stepping into the gym or trusting their bodies to do athletic feats. And mm -hmm. I, I get, a, I have a lot of um, gratitude and really enjoy helping, um, my my buddies who have helped me in poker help get their life together and, and get focused and get strong and um actually today uh jeremy osmus who's sneaky kind of a good athlete uh he right before this meeting was over here and we did 50 minutes in the sauna and then i put him in a 41 degree uh fahrenheit cold plunge for four minutes uh <laughs> that was that was a good time he's an animal too most people can't take it they freak out you know but he he did it that sounds uh yeah, I don't know. I've done some real, I've done some cold plunges, but I don't, I've never done anything. Well, I've done something for four minutes, but I, the last one I did, I remember it being like, I was about to freeze my balls off after like 45 seconds. I was like, get me the fuck out of here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's one of those, it's, it's one of the magical things not to just uh, go off on a tangent about cold plunges, but it's one of the magical things to, you realize that your, your brain is telling you that you're in pain when, you may be in pain, but it's, it's a temporary thing and you know, it's temporary. And if you can overcome that, it's like, you've done something hard for the day. And, and I personally, I, I feel a little more motivated to get out there and get things done if I've done something hard. Well, uh, bringing it back to poker, uh, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you say that's kind of the same thing I, in theory as a, a downswing? I mean, like, is it really like, as an example, I mean, I'm not the perfect one to talk, although I've been better lately. Uh, isn't the perfect example when you go when you you're losing uh uh 200k or something but you're still doing well or uh you're still rich or that sort of situation 
situation. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I think that uh, the way that I would put it is, if you practice struggles every day, you do deal with the real ones a little better when they come at you. I think it's even like visualizing and running through all the alternatives in your head of a, a way something can play out and coming to peace with it before yeah. you deal with it, at least with me, given, you know, my background, um, you know, coming from a, a really, um, every podcast I talk about this, so I don't have to, but coming from like a really chaotic childhood and being in, in domestic abuse and stuff like my oh, sort of nervous system and my brain, um, responds to very minor things in in a very kind of zero to a hundred fashion hmm. and so that it's right yeah yeah so it's extra important for me to practice um governing that and like experiencing those feelings and and staying calm and, and collected and um you know whether that be all the million things that everyone talks about now visualization uh therapy exercise things like that that sounds like a well you initially it sounded like you're referring to a stoic stoic responses you think of everything bad that can happen you deal with it beforehand um although after you, you know when do you want to talk about the child abuse stuff or domestic uh i mean it's it's really played out uh you know it's not something um it, it's i've talked about it a hundred times before but it is necessary to uh for that to be you know, like a prerequisite to understanding why I work really hard at specific things, because it, the things that help me might not necessarily be useful or as useful to other people, because they may not just be dealing with the baggage that I deal with. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, this yeah, sounds like so a pretty tough thing to deal with, just from my understanding, is it does create, if you're abused by someone that you're attached to, this does create, uh, I've looked into it quite a bit, because I dealt with someone who was abused by someone they were attached to. And uh, it does create some really difficult mental patterns to get over. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's as real as anything else, you know. Like a good um, good example would be years for years and years and years. I would drop a say I dropped a glass. I was doing the dishes and I dropped a glass. Whatever it shatters on the floor. Well, what are you supposed to do? You sweep the thing up. You throw it away. Who cares? You got plenty of money. You can buy another glass. But for me, I would hear that thing shatter and be like fuck and freak out you know like over oh, basically shit. nothing it's just like things that trigger you and your brain just immediately dumps you full of adrenaline and um you know a bunch of chemicals that other people just don't get i would get like instantly on the fly and hmm. so that reprogramming myself is um probably the most difficult thing i've ever had to do and it requires a lot of my time so a lot of this stuff you know people might be like well Jason's pretty hardcore when it comes to dialing it in and, you know, his diet is strict and he works out this much. And he does this and that, but it's just like very, very necessary for me because a lot of the normalcy that other people just naturally carry, I have to really work at. Oh, well, it seems like it's benefit you, benefited you indirectly. In, in oh a yeah. Way. No, right, it's well, great. Yeah. I, I said, like, oh yeah. <laughs> like AMAC, uh, Amit Makija made a really, really funny tweet the other day, completely owned me. Like I was trying to sound like this enlightened guy when somebody um, somebody said something about like Chris Kruk made a tweet about being like really angry. And and I and I like came in and said, you know, hey, anger was my primary motivator for 20 some years and it's it's not sustainable. And then AMAC comes in and he says, dude, you're a millionaire with a six pack like it served you just fine, you know. And so it's uh, it is it is a good point to make, like even though. You know, the fuel to the fire may, may not have been healthy. It, it has definitely um, helped me stay motivated to do a lot of things that are very good for me. Yeah, it's uh, the fire is one way to motivate people. It's, yeah. uh, it can be an effective one, particularly if, um, if it works. But there's a low, uh, what's the word? It's low conversion rate in terms of yeah. liability. Because the way I look at it, like a lot of people will not be able to get over that hump. Um, yeah, I'll so, tell you something that I haven't talked about on a podcast before that I actually think is quite useful that we could talk about. Yeah. And it's related to this is so over the past few years, I've really come into my stride as a person. I'm starting to feel like, hey, I'm actually kind of regular and like I can fit into society now. I'm not like this caged animal. I'm not like a liability. I'm not going to snap on someone for no reason. But there was this fear that I look back and I think, man, like 
I really like that hurt and that pain and that like fire that I get when I feel like I make a mistake or like, um, I feel like I get got, like, I never forget like a hand that I've played that I messed up because it hurt me so bad. And, you know, in a lot of ways that served me because I went home and I looked up the hand and I studied it inside and out and I got better for it. And I was afraid, and I guess still am sometimes that me dealing and, 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 and progressing through all of this stuff will in some ways weaken me because I, I will get over, I'll forgive myself quicker for making mistakes and I'll get over things that I screwed up because I'm human. And then I won't have that hunger to go figure it out. So like, I kind of sometimes am afraid to let go of the pain inside of myself because I'm afraid it'll make me worse in my career, which is insane. But like, uh, that's something that I, I feel like is probably pretty common. I've had that problem. Um, that being said, I mean, there are probably ways around it. I, uh, I'm trying to think of what I did. I just, um, let's, let me think. I had that problem myself, exactly that. I wanted to beat myself up every time I lost uh, a hand. I, in fact, I felt like I didn't play very well a lot of the time. A lot of the time I'm thinking there, sitting there feeling like, shit, I haven't played that well. I could do all these things better. I should have used an asymmetric size against this guy because he folds more against 30% potter, like in, things like that. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, like now it makes sense that they're probably not going to bluff here um, kind of thing. Um, well, apparently, according to research, it's better to uh, forgive yourself, uh, even statistically, when you make mistakes. Uh, and it it's a bit of a bit of an illusion at a certain point is what I've read. I, I'm trying to think of what I did to actually get over that. Um, I definitely haven't done it 100%, but really nasty mistakes, usually outside of poker, I'm a lot less uh, forgiving, uh, I guess you could say. Um, mm, yeah, maybe for that one, it helps to have some mindset shifts. I would think at your level that you, uh, at, at your level of success, you're no longer worried about, you know, if you perform subpar, you'll get it back and you'll still be excellent and you'll still be uh, a perfect or pretty good ambassador, perfect, whatever, whatever, however you view yourself. Yeah, I don't view myself in any of those ways, but I, I, I see what you're getting to. And, and I do, uh, I do agree with you that it's an illusion to think that baggage could somehow make you stronger than getting through it in any way. Yeah. Uh, generally, now I'm more on the board of uh, slight discomfort, continuous slight discomfort discomfort um if it can if it can be done that way with some patching how do you say some some comforting if there's too much discomfort if that makes sense is ideal or or uh things are too easy uh keep to intensify things a little bit more somehow uh come to realize that that's an ideal rod i'm not offering advice really that's just my point of view and uh I think you're doing just fine whatever uh, i think you're actually probably one of the best players these days thanks man i really appreciate that that's high praise yeah i'm a, uh uh i would i'm really curious to see to know how you did get over this kind of stuff in the past actually because i mean i can see some parallels to poker in a way like it's like the issues of poker on steroids like in poker there's all the, people have all these kinds of emotional issues um and have to change themselves emotionally yeah. which not an easy task but changing childhood baggage is another story like it's like well the, the biggest thing the biggest thing that i did is um i surrounded myself with people who love me and and i made a you know I, I really made an active effort to get rid of people that that weren't rooting for me. Um, and you know, the, my strategy is give the most that I possibly can to the people that care about me and love them unconditionally and, and go from there. And it's just been, it's been an incredible strategy. You know, a lot of people in my life and it, you know, poker gets a bad raps. Uh, a lot of people were talking about this recently on Twitter, the discussion came up and I said, you know, some people may not feel this way. I believe Garrett Adelstein, said something to the nature that like he's almost 
close with no one in poker. And, uh, you know, I really respect that guy. He seems like, a, seems like a really, really solid dude. I don't know him very well, but he seems like, you know, a really incredible guy. And, uh, but for me, the experience is the exact opposite. Maybe that's because, you know, I didn't have a lot of family and, um, and after I moved away from home to play poker, I basically had no friends other than poker friends, but a lot of my closest friends are like fam, like family to me are, are from the poker world. Uh, I would say my experience is the exact op, pretty much the exact opposite. I find there's actually, I find, I think a poker is more of like a, uh, how do you say like a, it's like Peter Pan. If you know, if you watch this movie, it's, it's almost like there's not all, uh, at least high stakes poker. There's not a whole lot of, uh, I mean, yeah, people lose, but it's a bunch of like people playing a game for money and most reputable players overwhelmingly pay. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's some scumbags and some people who do shitty things, but uh, generally speaking, I actually find it to be one of the cleaner industries that I've had experience in. There's all sorts of crazy stuff. In fact, uh, it, it did a poor job of preparing me for the real world uh, as I explored other areas of, man, there's just so much, just the real world is so sleazy by comparison. Like poker is like quite egalitarian and people are pretty nice when they're successful. They're actually much more straightforward, um, much less uh, in office and in inauthenticity etc things like that yeah uh, definitely trustworthy i mean there's guys you know how many people in poker would just say hey dan can i get 100k i'll pay you back in two hours and you just hand them 100k i mean there's like you know there's a lot of people that you would do that for and not think twice about it in poker if you said something like that in the real world people's heads would explode yeah yeah i mean also i don't know what kind of business experience you've had uh, that's a good question also uh, it seems that you seem like the kind of guy who would make a lot of stupid business decisions. That's my cold read for I you. I wouldn't. You wouldn't. Am I wrong about that? Um, well, early in my life, I was definitely way too emotional with, um, you know, handing out money blindly to people because I just wanted them to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that I loved. And uh, I wouldn't think too strategically about where that money was going. Um, so... I guess you could say that that was a could have been bad business decisions, but other than that, I've really done a good job of betting on myself or the people that I really can see day in and day out what they're doing, what they're up to, how hard they're working from within poker. Um, and so I feel like the my business side and the way that I've conducted things in poker is is actually been incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh... For some reason, I had that perception is that you would, uh, I don't know, it just didn't seem too spicy with your kinds of investments. And invest, invest I'm, I'm not, I'm stuff. not. I don't, I'm very, very selective with where, where action goes or where, where my money goes. And a lot of that's just a function of I just need more free time too. Like there's a lot of people who might be, you know, plus EV in a spot, but I just pass on it because I, I've already spread myself too thin. I, I get too many text messages, too many things I have to respond to per day. And and I've realized that it takes me out of being present with my son and my family. And uh, so, you know, in a lot of ways now, I'm just trying to reduce the amount of interactions I, I have to have. Well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you've got, if you're looking for simplicity and just solid making money and focusing on family, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah, I, I also personally, as someone who is not particularly great with my investments, uh, I would advise being really selective and um, in the sense of knowing the person very, very well. I mean, you can't say this enough. And uh, making sure that they work hard uh, or are accountable if they don't in some kind of way. Like, I, I became really selective myself with staking, especially because there are all sorts of bad experiences that I had. And, uh, yeah, it's a, a slippery slope to mess up. It's much, it's tougher in a way than poker. Just be, and actually winning at poker, just because, just because, uh, I mean, you have to deal with people, and it's a little bit different. Poker players aren't really good at managing people. Usually, are you good at managing people, uh, Jason? Um. Well, 
I'm blind. Uh, I'm oblivious to a lot of things, but luckily my wife is extremely keen at keeping an eye on the things that I'm up to. She's also extremely keen to my own weaknesses. So she'll catch me in loops of complaining about things that or people that I've run in with or whatever that like, then like six months later, I'll kind of forget about the negative experience that I have with them. And I'll like, you know, just kind of want to put myself in the same situation. And she'll be like, Hey, you just, you're just complaining about this or that. So like, she is really, really good at finding uh, the inaccuracies that I have whenever it comes to my judgment with people or, or my time in general and calling me out. So um, I think I got a lot better seven and a half years ago when Bianca and I got together at that. Yeah, well, that's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, found somebody so supportive and seems like you're living the American dream, actually. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way, man. Well, I'm happy for you. You also have the integrity to match. Uh, pretty sp uh, blameless record. Um, the, your reputation precedes you in the poker world. Uh, I was gonna, oh, what are your plans for the future? You're just going to play big tournaments? Do you have any other things in mind? You know, I, I, I never want to be one of these guys who says, like, the end is near or I want to do this radical change because I still, like, absolutely love poker. I study every day. I, um, I don't watch a lot of poker in TV, but I, I keep an eye on what's going on. But I, I really am into my own little projects. And um, I guess I've just gotten so into the habit of doing it that it's just like a safe space for me. So getting better at poker is something that brings me a lot of joy still. And I feel like if that's there, then I can go play and feel good about it. But um, the day that I stop getting excited about learning about the game, um, you know, I, I can see myself uh, tapering off. And, and I'm, I'm always uh, with open ears and open eyes of opportunities that may present themselves you know but i just really want to make sure that i'm doing a better job moving forward in my life that now that i've earned kind of the luxury of being able to take my time and figure things out since i've made some money in poker uh that i'm i'm working towards things that are of true interest of mine and not just because of pressure or image or ego and the same and that being said also for you know my poker career i want to make sure that i'm not just traveling to every poker stop because I want to be, you know, this or that. I, I want to go to poker stops because I'm excited to play them. And if I'm mm -hmm. not excited to play them and it doesn't align with what I, I'm, I'm into at that moment, then I'm, I'm not going to go play big tournaments. So as for now, you know, in, in the very, very short term, yes, I'm going to go to Cyprus. I'm going to play these, these Tritons uh, over the next year. I'll, I'll play all the Tritons and a few super high rollers here and there. Um, but for the most part, um, I really – I'm into reading right now. I'm trying to catch up on a lot of things that I, I wasn't really educated or, or didn't really value as, a, as an adolescent or as a teenager. So I'm into trying to improve at the things that I think I'm quite weak at. Uh, such as, do you want to go into them? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Like, like lately, it's just been trying to understand the way that, um, you know, the way the economy works. Um, the predicting factors on what's in front of us in the next couple of years. You know, there's been a lot of, a lot of talk of us being in a recession and how bad it's going to get and then potential war. And so I'm just trying to learn a little bit more about the world because the truth of it is, is I've just been in my own poker bubble and kind of um, purposefully ignorant to the world around me because it's such an overwhelming feeling. But now with a child in the world, I feel a little more responsibility to try to understand and predict things that could happen in the future, so I could uh, make sure that he's set up with a with a solid um, a solid setup as he goes along. Yeah, it's a bit weird with uh, U.S. politics and education. I personally think uh, there should be an educational reform uh, for one thing. Uh, I think that's in the future, especially considering. I mean, poker in a way was a very unique opportunity for people like us because uh education for most people is getting more and more um especially as they get older especially as uh, things evolve faster and faster it's getting more and more it has to take a new form because you know book what do you read in like some standardized education uh 
how do you say like college is becoming less and less relevant you have to like know how to do especially with the uh you have to do you know have to do certain things that are not so reproducible by ai and uh just re reproducible period because now you have to compete with people from china and like or uh they're india that are able to do manual labor much faster because of the internet things are scaling super fast so a different kind of uh teaching or kind of approach to life is required as you get older um which i think will really change a lot of things and poker is possibly a unique opportunity for a number of outliers in some ways it's pretty good living actually if uh someone could figure out how to be successful at it yeah yeah it's the best yeah uh do you have any uh plans did you have any op investment opportunities or plans outside of poker uh that you were looking into um, I've invested in a, a ton of different things, um, but it's just kind of a long-term plan just sit around and, and all of them are passive investments. I'm not directly, uh, I'm not directly involved with, you know, it, future projects for me probably aren't going to be as related to making money or scaling. They're going to be more related to just providing joy and, and helping, helping other people. And I'm sure that that'll fall somewhere in my interests of health and wellness. All right. Well, that's the theme of uh, one of the main themes of the podcast is is with the altruistic bent of uh, helping others. If you if there's anything you'd like to promote or any um, and on that note, if you'd like to promote any resources that you have yourself, uh, any websites or links, uh, now's a good time to talk about it. Well, I have no um, no charitable stuff to promote, but I will say that. I am extremely interested in helping young people figure it out, figure out their emotions, um, expose people that aren't able to see a bigger part of the world being from West Virginia and not being on an airplane until I was 18 years old and hardly ever leaving the state unless it was for a track meet or something. Um, I, I want to make sure to focus on giving um, the youth a chance to see how big and beautiful the world is. So. If you happen to know ways to do that, definitely hit me up. All right. Amazing. Well, thank you for your time, Jason. It's been great having you on. Thanks, man.